This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation. On today's show, we bring you part two of Kamla's interview with Dr. Michael Merzenik. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Dr. Michael Merzenik, and we are continuing our conversation with him about neuroplasticity and other uh, things that he has done. You've led a fascinating life, uh, Dr. Merzenik. You are a professor, teacher, author, entrepreneur, uh, scientist. I mean, any label that I can think of, you've done it, including uh, you know, owning a vineyard. Okay, the only thing you haven't done is music. Uh, well, I, I'm a very bad saxophone player. Oh, you are a, you're a saxophone player. <laughs> okay. So in, in, in our previous conversation, we uh, talked about your initial work at right. the University of California, San Francisco. Right. So you helped uh, figure out and uh, bring a product to market, a listening device, right. a, a cochlear implant. Is that right. the right way to mm -hmm. say it? Right. Okay. Now, from there, you then got interested in neuroplasticity. Neuroplastic right. And you did a lot of research, and then you decided you wanted to open a company. Right. But you, it was a struggle. You were very good as a researcher. You could write a PhD thesis. You could write all sorts of papers. Right. But when it came to a business plan, what happened? Well, actually, I, I actually had the first sort of turmoil around this when we licensed the patents for the cochlear implant. Hmm. Because, because I went to the university, and I said, I think we have a practical device that should be manufactured because it can benefit people in the world and, and um, which should get out there to help people. And um, so they organized the, an, a meeting with a, with a medical device manufacturer. So this person shows up, the, these, this little team of people from this company show up and they look at me in the eye and they say, where the hell are the patents? And I said, well, um, the, uh, you know, we work for a public university and this is, uh, you know, we're not trying to constrain anything. We're trying to deliver things out in the world. They said, well, you, you want us to invest 50, $100 million to reduce this to practice and deliver it in the world without protection? And I looked at them and said to myself, holy cow, what an idiot. So I went back to the laboratory and to the team. This is a true story. And I said, Where, what do we have to patent? So we wrote several patents about sort of what we were contemporarily working on. We could have written all of the original patents for cochlear implant uh, technology. And those patents ultimately in the UC system reached the level of number six in value to the UC system. But I realized at that point that I had almost no understanding of how to translate you know, information from the laboratory to, the, to, to industry. But certainly one thing I understood is that you needed to write patents. So, so, so that was your first learning. We're, fa a we're fast forwarding, and now I, we've created. We, we realize the brain is plastic, and I've formed an alliance with a wonderful scientist from uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey, who argued that children that couldn't read, for the most part, these children st who struggle to read, have problems in how they process information as listeners in high speed. They basically are very sluggish in their brain in how they process the details of what they hear. And therefore, when they translate what they hear to its right to writing, it makes no sense to them. The lag is too much. Yeah, the lag is, you could say, it's not really resolving the details that are translated by letter. So the, the translation of letter makes no sense. Well, I knew this was something we could fix, at least in a, in a monkey brain. So we actually created games that hy would hypothetically repair this in a child. And we trained this group of children and fix them. Mm. Now they were uh, listening, their listening abilities were, were pretty normal, and now they were unable to read. So I realized that this applied to you know, millions of children. So I went to the university and I said, um, I have something that I think should be translated out to the benefit of these children, to these populations. This is just the tip of a very big iceberg. There are many, many other things like this we could think about and try to address like this by using brain training in this intensive kind of intensive form. So I said, and, and uh, I don't really want to give up my position as a professor, but I do want to see this get into the world. And I'd written several patents, uh, which was subsequently awarded. So the chancellor of the University of California formed a Blue Ribbon Committee. What is a Blue Ribbon Committee? Well, it was uh, at that point, you know, five or six of the wealthiest Bay Area 
residents, the chairman of the committee. High was, net worth individuals. High net worth individuals. <laughs> That's the right term now. Uh, the, the chairman was, was, was Charles Schwab. Oh, of Schwab. Uh, Schwab, oh, finance, okay. you know, the, uh. this guy. And then and there, there's a couple other, even at that point, billionaires on this, in, this, in this little group of people. And, and Charles Schwab wrote me an email, and he said, he said, bring a business plan. So I'm a scientist, and I never had a business plan. I said, what the hell is that exactly? So I... This is pre-internet? Uh, yeah, really. Okay. Well, you could say sort of in the... The start of the... The cusp of the... Internet. Okay. Anyway, to make a long story short, the main, most main thing feature of my business plan was I made it, put it in a really nice plastic folder. I remember this very clearly. I can almost see it. It was so beautiful. And then I, <laughs> then I had a scientific you know, explanation of why this was important to do and, and then a paragraph or two about why it was the best thing since, uh, you know, sliced bread. And, and uh, I can, I'll never forget that he came into the room and he had this little plastic folder that I'd given him and he slammed it down on the table in front of me and said, this is not a business plan. He said, it doesn't, I wish I could say this with a vehemence, he said it, because he said it vehemently. He said, he said, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know who you're doing it for. You don't know who's going to buy it. You don't know what it's going to cost. You don't know where the market, on and on, you know, all of the obvious, all of the obvious things. So anyway, we spent, I spent an hour talking with these, uh, these gentlemen, uh, mostly being corrected by them quite usefully. You know, one of the things I found in interacting with businessmen as a scientist it's, it's almost always a positive learning experience for them. I'm not always sure how strong a positive for them learning because? experience. No, for, for me. Okay. I'm not sure how much of a learning experience it was for them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the upshot of this was is that they told the chancellor that, this, that he should support this, that he should la- allow, he said, that, he said, Professor Mersenich has to be involved in the translation it, you know, you should probably let him keep his position and let him take a leave of absence and start. So they batted is, for you. This is important in the world. They batted for me. And so that was wonderful for me because I was the first scientist at the University of California that was allowed to contribute to the founding of the company uh, without, without giving up my position. And, and the first thing I did day one was begin seeking a business partner that could help me make write a proper business plan. So who was that? And help me in business target. Well, it was, a, it was a young man named Dave Sharon, who was a young, you know, MBA, fresh, freshly, new, pretty freshly minted MBA. From? That, that at least knew the rules. He was a UC Berkeley guy. Okay. So uh, that helped me basically create this superstructure and uh, that uh, ultimately helped uh, acquire the financing to initiate the first So now company. you know what's a cap table, you know, uh, what now vesting. I, all of those things. And what a, what a wonderful learning experience it was. I mean, I, it was sort of like being a first-year graduate student again. I mean, there's so many interesting things. And, you know, in the university, you sit and you think about people on the business side as sort of contaminants. Mm. And, um, you know, lesser, lesser breed, you know, <laughs> you know, not quite morally, you know. But you quite, you quite quickly realize that they are basically, it's just like the university. There are people that have good motives and, and weaker motives. And, and there, but many, many intelligent people, and they're all specialists. And, of course, their contribution to business creation and success is just as critical as any scientist for sure. So if there's a young researcher out there or a young person who has got a great idea and right. he has to write a business plan, right. what advice would you give them? Get help. But get help <laughs> how? But even yeah, but right. where do you start? You know, what, what, should, what are the five things well, that must be there in a n- business now plan? The, now, now there's so much more, there's so many, many more sources of advice and help. You know, books have been written and, but and even courses then it's a can little be confusing. taken. No, I agree with that completely. No, I think I think the, the, I, I've always felt that the way that, that that all such things are necessarily team events. Mm. That is to say, that one of the things that you should think about is how you can create this sort of cluster of people. Mm. It takes to do if you're if you're a scientist, you're a scientist, and you need to create. I mean, you you want to be cross educated and try to understand the, the basic operational principles that apply in the business side, of course. And maybe the business by its nature will, should be led by a scientist on some sort of, so, so, so high, but, but not without, not without the expert collaboration of somebody that's just as effective and useful as you are coming from the business side. Or maybe that cluster would involve three or four or five or six really necessary 
other leadership elements that represent that span of expertise you need to do something as big as your idea. And so that's why I say almost all of these, these things now are team science, and they really require that you get the very best people around you to help you and empower the people that are empowered like you're empowered and uh, to do the big thing together. But is there anything you would offer to somebody on what they should look for a business plan in terms of uh, looking after themselves? You know, sometimes you're not aware that there are certain things that you need to take care of yourself. Oh, oh, Nobody's oh, oh, going oh, to tell oh, you. Oh, oh, absolutely. What I strongly recommend when people come to me, first of all, people commonly come to me from the university or other environment saying, I'm thinking of doing this in, in business and what should I do? And I, and I, I strongly say, it's one th thing that I did as a young scientist, I said, well, who in my university, in this case, left the university and, 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 and contributed to the establishment of businesses? And I went to several of those individuals and I said, could you, do you sit down and talk to me for an hour and, and, um, and, 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 and be an advisor to me about how I should think about this and think about the organization and think about financing and think about, uh, about the uh, sort of progressive planning and, and, and structure to make this happen? And I got wonderful advice from people that, that uh, through that process. So I would absolutely say that's something that you should do or try to do. Okay. And I would help, if anybody came to me, I would absolutely sit down and try to tell them about my own experiences and where the pitfalls are. Mm. Then your second company you started a little later, Posit Science. Right. Uh, how easy or difficult was it to set the second company up? Well, it was hard <laughs> only because when I created the first company, I wrote many patents. So I've written, you know, 60, 70 patents and across this period of time in the first co company. And then I tried to license the patents back and it actually, but I'd convinced the first company how valuable they all were. And meanwhile, I was back at the university. Uh. <laughs> so I had to, it actually took a change in the CEO of the, of the first company to come to a reasonable, to, to, to an investor, a reasonable condition to license back the patents from the first to apply in other domains or other realms. Uh, uh, so that was the only thing difficult about it. I mean, you know, if the, the ideas had value and acquiring financing was relatively easy, uh, you know, not that there aren't always complications and pitfalls to bring something to the world that's a big success, but, uh, but uh, it was not that formidable. And we had the experience of going through this process for the first time. So the first company uh, was uh, targeting young kids and helping them with right. their uh, disabilities right. and overcome the... Right. The second company, Posit Science, is for adults. Well, it's for two populations. It's for, it's for somebody that has a serious neurological problem. You could say whether they're a child or adult. So oh. we, do, we, do, uh, we do have programs that apply to children, but they're children that are more in a medical realm, you could say. They're children that are more severely limited or impaired or struggling. And that, but primarily our focus is on adults with acquired problems or adults in normal aging or adult performance because we train many people that are in the normal, completely normal realm on the job or to improve their job performance or in the community to improve their life uh, in, uh, or whatever. So in the adults, it's sort of the broad sweep of, of how you'd engage a brain to improve it, whether you're struggling. I would say the majority of people we're helping in some level or another are struggling in age or struggling because they have a neurological psychiatric condition. But we're also training people like policemen, soldiers, you know, many other people that, in which uh, their in performance way? will be advantaged by uh, improving their brain, like you'd improve the brain of a musician or you'd improve the brain of an athlete. We, in fact, we are training athletes uh, and uh, by improving their brain. Through exercises? Through brain exercises. Okay, and mindfulness is something that you point out is very important. Mindfulness is a big asset, in, especially in any brain that's, you could say, in any sense hypersensitive or, or needs to be calmed down on a regular basis, and that's many brains. How do you define mindfulness? Well, mindfulness is, is, is a sloppy term because it means a lot to a lot of different people. You know, on the one hand, it is the active processes of, of, uh, of meditation or focus and attention control that, and, and it's a form of, you could say, attention control exercises that, are, it, that has a powerful impact in quieting the brain and, and uh, sort of reducing the noisiness and the noise, noisy operations of the brain. And, the other, and on another level, it's simply being connected. 
as a connected, a physically observant, connected. Well, you, you 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 walk across the landscape and you see the roses and smell them and you see the brightness of the color and you look for the surprises and you're connected to the world. You're looking at it squarely in the eye and you're listening and smelling it and feeling it because you are it's present in your mind. So I think the old folks, or when I say old folks, I mean people that lived in the 18th or 19th century, who right. came up with the term, smell the roses, yeah. you know, make hay while the sun shines. Right. I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, what shall I say, there's a lot of uh, strength or uh, knowledge in those uh, pithy... Uh, I call it, I say, you know, and the, the mantra is live life like, like, like a child again. That Live is to say, life like a child again. That is to say, in your son, as you move across the landscape, pay attention to the details of what you see here, feel, and We smell. forget to pay attention. Yeah, and, and, and your brain needs this. This is a critical form of exercise. I mean, we, we walk through landscapes as an adult like zombie. You know, I like to say, <laughs> I have this exercise exercise in my book, Softwired, and it's that imagine what's on your street in your mind. Mm. You live in a block on a street, Imagine all of the details of the houses and the shrubs and the trees and the flowers and, uh, the, and, and, and then reconstruct it in your mind and then go look. And most people will go look and they'll say, darn, you know, I did not realize those things were there. Or then imagine, move in your mind a block away or two blocks away, some place that you drive past or move past or walk past many, many times and say, what's there? And you'd be surprised most people are, are surprised by what's there. They don't see it. They're walking through it in a sense, blindly. And that disconnectedness, I mean, we're, we're meant to be masters of the world that we live in. That's one of the most critical things that our brain is up to. Our brain is continually looking at the, the details of what is in front of us and it's looking for anything that doesn't fit. It's looking for anything that's surprising, anything that's interesting. Pattern matching. The last thing you should be doing is walking down the street totally within yourself as a zombie. And this is what people, the modern human, commonly does. So in a variety of ways, we're trying to engage brains on the computer to enliven them again, to give them this critical sort of form of exercise. So I, I, I liken it to you've trained yourself to be an expert at something. Let's say that you're, you've trained yourself to be a professional musician. And in order to maintain your ability as a professional musician, you have to practice. And if you don't practice, you can't keep your job, you can't sustain your professional ability. If you don't practice for a year, you've lost your job, 10 years, you're no longer a professional. Well, if you, if you decided after not practicing for 10 years that you wanted to reinitiate your ability, could you do it? Could you recover your ability to reestablish a professional? You probably could. Why did you stop practicing? Why have you stopped practicing sustaining refinability and all the things that are important to you? Because most people in older life have stopped practicing. So we're trying to get people back, you could say, to speed. Because one of the things that happens when you don't practice is you slow down. Mm. And speed itself is a strong index of the general health of your brain. Ah. The slower your brain is, the closer you are to danger or to so real trouble. So sluggishness is a good sluggishness indicator. Sluggishness is a good indicator. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You know, you talked about mindfulness, meditation, and all of that. Right. Imagine that there is a monk who has been meditating for years right. in a monastery. And imagine a mother, a single mother, who's bringing up five kids right. all by herself. Right. Who do you think has the more interesting brain? Well, I think that's a really good question because I think that the ideal brain has a combination of the two. This is my own feeling. That, that is to say, I think you want a brain that internally by your own control has powers, amongst has powers that the mother of five doesn't have. But there's also an operational brain that, that deals with all of the, the complex sort of interactive processes in the real world, of machines and... And, and, and the sort of complexities that deal with a, with a life. The monk's not practicing that very much, but mom is practicing those things a lot. So, you know, I like to say that the, the healthiest brain of all is the brain that's really, really good at both dimensions. That is to say, in their operations in the real world and the operations in the internal world of thought and thought control and in the control of your attention internally. Let me add one more variable to that. 
everything else being equal between both of them. You know, one is uh, in a monastery and the other is a mother bringing up. And the common variable they both have is they both are doing things lovingly. Yeah. How important is love in neuroplasticity? Man, that is, that is real important. That's one of the key assets. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's really reflecting. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's actually the machinery that's actually controlling change is machinery that also is expressing those, those emotions. It's, it's responsible for expressing those emotions. That's, it's absolutely critical. So it is the generous and loving person, you could say, that has a well-supported brain from the point of view of the machinery of the brain that controls change. And one of the things you want to do is you want to have that aspect of your machinery, of your brain, be healthy. Has that been studied, the impact of love? It's been studied a lot in, 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 in a way. That is to say, it's been, we, we understand how to engage it. It's the, uh, it's the basis of some of the most wonderful research in the brain in, in studies that have been conducted in animal models. So I understand we, you can write down equations that define the conditions under which you, the brain that's controlling these positive emotions are, are, uh, are released. And when we train a brain on our computer at a brain site like Brain HQ, we're trying to control it so that it idealizes this feedback that mm. comes back in these brain change from this brain change machinery. How do you practice positive thinking? How can you help yourself be a more positive person? You know, we live in trying times. Right. Uh, and we also live in trying times because we are all, like you said, semi-isolated. We're all, <coughs> you know, we're all married to this device here. Right. Morning and evening, you know, we, we, and we, this is what we look at every day. Right. Uh, what do you think we should be doing? Well, one of the things we know that, that confidence comes from, you could say that confident interactions come from, is relatively reliable, the reliable success. So actually what happens when I, when I engage my brain in a way then which I'm mostly advancing in my performance skills, let's say I get the answer right most of the time when I'm, when I'm uh, problem solving or I'm dealing with uh, whatever I'm working at to improve at, the brain actually advances its characteristics. So if I get the answer right, if I'm in an exercise on a computer at brain, on Brain HQ and I improve that's, it. That's the product that you hold. Yeah, and I improve on it. Actually what happens is that the brain basically accelerates. It slowly changes its processes. It, it, so you can say on the platform of what you can do, as long as you're getting the answer right most of the time, it's actually, machinery actually advances that in a way that enables you to go to a higher level. Now on the other hand, when I start making errors, it retreats. Mm. And, and actually in a normal life, from about the, the middle of the third decade of life, in your 20s, maybe around your 30th birthday, the brain of the average American goes into retreat. Why do you say American? Because, uh, because that's what you know? the largest studies have been done in American populations, that's all. Okay. Uh, it, you know, it would apply, and there, there might be a little variation in different populations, but in the average citizen or our culture, I would say, a culture like ours, you begin... Uh, declining mm. roughly from around your 30th birthday. Women a little later than men, but roughly then. And then there's a slow and steady decline, very predictable, it's sort of like the decline in your eyes, you know, and ultimately you need glasses. Very predictable and on the average. Can that be stopped or? Uh, Absolutely. How? It can be stopped by exercising your brain. It can be stopped by how you live your life. In fact, there's lots of variability in the population. Some people are really swift, really fast afoot internally in the brain really still highly, highly resolving information, still rapidly problem solving all kinds of, when, you know, into their older age. That's because of how they use their, how they engage it. But some of those people are socially awkward. Does that attribute, contribute towards uh, the That's decline? That's a really great insight because the social cognition machinery of the brain is substantially separate from the sort of general performance machinery of the brain. And, we, and, and, and you have to, in a sense, train both. You, you, a person can be smart as a whip but totally socially incompetent. Person can be quite socially competent and really pretty foolish, right? And we see these, and you can exercise one or the other, so we strongly urge people to pay attention to both dimensions of a life because this social cognition and social control is so important in a life for happiness. And on the other hand, this operational ability, you wanna keep working and be effective as long as you can and continue to grow as a person, you gotta take care of this part. My final question, we have run out of time. We could talk for hours, I think, or on weeks. the subject. Or, or weeks. <laughs> uh, are you self-aware of your own brain plasticity? Of course I am. 
No, I'm trying to live life to the advantage of my brain. I live my life as if my brain mattered. And, I, and, and everyone should. I mean, because it does matter, because it's me. And why would I waste the opportunity, you could say, to continue to try to work, strive for self-improvement? I'm sneaking in another question. Uh, what is the risk of knowing too much about the brain? Well, Two it's lines. A, it's a little bit dangerous to go, <laughs> from the point of view of it's challenging. Maybe you're religious or, or your sort of current philosophical expectations because what everything indicates is that you are a creation within your lifetime. The person that is you, the thing that is you, you, yourself, are a creation within your skull, within your lifetime. Which is I a think, little, therefore, I am. Which is a little scary. Dr. Merzenik, thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, we truly appreciate your time. It's, it's been a lot of fun, Kama. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our show, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. We'll be back again next week with another episode of our show. Until then, goodbye. This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business.